He ahara te ana e rangono ake nei e ko te tiuri uri o te hakuturi, ko tu i pea, ko weka pea. Kari aki na mai te rā i te pai, ka ao, ka ao, he rangi hou te nei, tēnā koutou katoa. No mai harama and welcome to the Hori Heresy Podcast. This is your host, Iru Hiko Tahuri. So this podcast finds its roots in the same reasons that I wrote my book, Māori Boy Atheist, and why I started the Heretical Hori blog, are to provide my point of view of being Māori and Atheist. Uh, when I came out Atheist, when I decided I was Atheist, um, I searched the internet, I searched everywhere, I looked in libraries, I couldn't find anything from any other Māori who talked about being an Atheist. And that was a little scary. So... In order to fix that, I wrote my own story and put it out there. It's available at smashwords.com. Just go to smashwords.com, search for Māori Boy Atheist, and you'll find it. It's a free download, available to anybody. So that's why I put out this podcast as well, to support that, to give Māori who are looking for somewhere to go when they're questioning their beliefs, um, they can find this, hopefully, somewhere. So, to that end, I'm kicking off this podcast by recording my book, NBA Māori Boy Atheist, and releasing it as a series of podcasts. So I'll be reading it chapter by chapter and releasing them once a week, starting this week. I also hope to be interviewing fellow Māori atheists out there to get their stories and perspectives on things like uh, karakia in schools, uh, the extent of the ecumenicism we see at Tangi and other places, and hui. Currently, we've also got issues like the Destiny Church people uh, and their interesting perspectives about for Māori. And I know a lot of us Māori atheists have a lot of problem with them online. That may be an uh, interesting subject to talk about. I've also interviewed a member of the Destiny Church and I gained a few interesting insights about that church. And though I didn't record it, I do want to see if I can interview that guy again. That was really, really interesting. I also want to do a couple of uh, interviews in Te Reo. That would be interesting for all the people who criticise me. And this is the reason why I want to do it. Saying that um, I'm an atheist because I think like a Pākehā. Um, that's insulting. But uh, I've definitely heard that and felt that. Um, in the time I released my book, I got that kōrero. <laughs> I got a lot of positive kōrero too as well, I must say. But that was one of the interesting ones. So I want to do a couple of uh, interviews in Te Reo Māori. Uh, tērā pēr, ko koe tēnā, e whakara ngō maina, uh, mā ne ko rero rā tāua pionera. Another thing that interests me is the, the Andy Narain cult that was around in the 70s that had a huge impact here on the east coast of the North Island. Andy Narain was a guy who ran an ashram he was a failed businessman and then opened an ashram down in uh, Greytown here in the North Island and uh, sucked a whole lot of people in, took a whole lot of people's money, ended up in court, going to jail. But it's a huge story and it still has impact now. Um, while I was researching some of that kōrero, I found a bit of resistance, but I also found some interesting kōrero as well. So I want to do a, a whole podcast about that. That'll be a, hopefully something interesting for you to listen to. Uh, there are lots of other things to talk about and I hope we can use this podcast to talk to each other. It's important to me that we share our kōrero together and I hope that some of my listeners, you, will be interested in coming on the podcast and talking about issues you've run into. First up, as uh, you listen to the introduction of NBA Māori Boy Atheist, please think about uh, getting in touch with me and sharing your story here on the uh, Hori heresy podcast i think it'll be a good thing if we can share some kōrero uh, together that would be awesome so here we go here's the introduction um to my book nba mighty boy atheist and remember i'm not a clever author it's a short book it was only 35 odd pages long it was more of a pamphlet i know it's not particularly well written <laughs> But it is my story and 
it was a beginning place for me so I'm sharing it here with you again freely available because well we need some stories out there no reira e tiwi koutou e whakarongo mai nga tēnei rātou mihi ake ke au koutou katoa Introduction It's the 19th of June in the hospital of a small east coast town of Wairo, New Zealand at around 9 o'clock in the morning I have just been born My mother is tired My father is absent It is 1970 after all and all fathers were never present at the birth Awaiting my arrival at home, being babysat by family, were four older sisters under the age of nine. My mother is European and Māori, my father is Māori. Unbeknown to all of us, in six weeks, my mother would become a widow and my father the victim of cancer. This was my entrance into the world. With five children under the age of nine, my mother would become father as well. We're a poor family in a poor town. The local meatworks was, and still is, the largest employer. My mother worked hard in any place she could to get employment. There was very little help to single parents at that time, and having five children would not have been easy. Thanks, Mum. I also have to thank my mother for the scepticism she had, and which I learnt. It wasn't scepticism of the sceptical movement as we know now, but a general distrust of churches and their preachments. I remember a conversation I had had with her about religion and her saying that God had to be a real suspect character because he created us and then would punish us if we didn't thank him for it. I remember being surprised by that. Surprised because I had never heard anyone talk about God being anything other than good. This may have been the first seed of doubt So The aim of writing this book is to tell my story out of religious belief. For myself more than anything else but also to hopefully encourage other Māori along the way on the journey out of religion. As I was in the process of apostasy, I searched in vain to find stories of other Māori who were trying to escape the rabbit hole of religion. I found plenty of books that talked about Māori belief and how Māori have created their own versions of Christianity. Māori media are also full of Christianity. Take for example the programs on Māori television like He Iwi Whakapuno or the recent series about Māori prophets. But I found no books and no reference about Māori who had left religion. I am sure there are other Māori atheists in the world, but there aren't many outspoken Māori atheists. So I decided to write this book so that hopefully other Māori will have at least one example to read about. I also hope that by reading my story, other Māori atheists may be able to glean some inspiration from the story and write, or at least talk about, their own atheism to others. Recently I have had discussion with friends and relatives about this book and this only confirmed that religion or the lack of it is not a subject that many are comfortable with. It seems that I may be transgressing upon an unspoken taboo. I have come to believe that writing about my lack of belief has made many people very uncomfortable. Some friends who are believers have expressed concern that I have not thought about it enough. Other people have threatened violence, but more than that, others have become curious as to how I could have been an atheist and have asked if I would let them know when the book is released so that they could read about it. They could have just asked me, but I guess they are wanting to support me by buying the book. I know it's optimistic, but this is my guess and I'm sticking to it until I get here evidence to the contrary. However, I suspect it may be just easier to read about it than to ask direct questions of me. I have no doubt there are Māori who are true believers. They believe with all that they have there is a God and He cares about them. I do not. In this book I do not address those whose faith is unshakable. They are probably would not even open this book given its title. So it is to those Māori who can't quite swallow the whole story of Christianity that I address. To those Māori who are beginning to question the belief systems that they were raised with, but have become uncomfortable. Those who are not sure, those that don't think humankind are at the centre of creation. Those Māori who see that science they learnt at school doesn't fit with what they learnt in church. It is perhaps not surprising that given the history of Māori and the swift adoption to Christianity, it is expected that growing up Māori, you would, of course, know prayers and be able to recite them by heart without flinching. So religion and belief in God is just expected. 
There was never any pressure. It was just assumed that you believe, and everyone carries on if you do. In writing this book, I make no claim to academic excellence. I do not have any journalism, anthropology qualifications. I am no academic. What I do have is a lifetime of experience, my own thoughts and my own story, and this is what I tell. It has been a long, sometimes arduous, lonely, frightening, but ultimately rewarding one. I have always questioned the things that didn't seem right or fair, as I believe we all do as children. Even when I was told not to, I still did, but in my head and not out loud. I am sure this willingness to question everything has led me to the conclusion that there are no gods, other than those constructed by and for humans. It will become apparent along the way I forgot to question and was led to a place of fear. It was questioning everything that was to be my saviour and not a Palestinian prophet of 2,000 years ago. I am aware that I live in New Zealand, which by all accounts is one of the more secular countries in the world. So the story I write in the following pages may just be the story of many told by me, and therefore is akin to seeing nothing new. But again I bark on the sortie into the past more for myself than any the other. But perhaps my story may find resonance with other young Māori, who find themselves without faith in any gods, and who has, or is, struggling with that non-belief when in our culture religion seems to hold sway. In chapter 1 I recount some of the memories of the varieties of churches I attended as a child and how they made me feel. In chapter 2 I explain how Christianity in particular has influenced some Māori cultural practices as I participated in and observed them. I also tried to describe some of the ways I participate in those practices now that I am an atheist. Chapter 3 describes how failing to question things led to dark places and how careful thought and a Presbyterian minister started my apostasy and eventual atheism. Chapter 4 is a short description of my own thoughts on Eastern religious stuff. Chapter 5 is all about now. As I think about the part religion has played in my life, I now recognise that my path to atheism was almost inevitable, or at least my path away from Christianity was, given the variety of churches I had contact with. So for my sake, more than anyone else, let's get started. Chapter 1. Get them while they're young. The Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints. Yes, was all I could answer as the elders yelled at me, trying to confirm that I was ready to be accepted into their church. More yelling and more of me saying yes, or more like whispering, as those Mormon elders harangued me and put me through a scrutiny I think now more appropriate to adults than my six-year-old self. I don't even remember the questions that were being held at me in front of a full church and, as a very, very shy child, I'm surprised at my ability to even mutter a syllable, let alone the actual word yes. This image is the first that appears when I challenge myself to find earliest memories of religious influence hidden amongst other memories of my childhood. Quickly on the heels of that first piece of recall follows the memory of being in Gisborne at a rally for other youth of that same church. We were all gathered in order to share a day of fellowship under the protective eye of the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints. I offer the following recollection of memory, partly in order to show some of the activities we took part in, but also, as only a little brother can, to irk my sisters with memories that may embarrass them. My sisters were all, I think, present at this gathering and, we were play and they were playing parts in a remake of the play Cinderella. I can't remember who played which part, but I do know it was very well received, and I know I laughed at this modernised version of the classic fairy tale. I seem to remember a skateboard, it was the 70s after all, being a central prop of the play. Thank you, my sisters, for the memories. Recalling much else of my experience of the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints is much more difficult, except for memories in the darkest depths of visits to our house by elders of the church. I remember being struck by the fact that these elders weren't old at all but were young. I probably should have served as a warning but it went right over this child's head. There could have been a couple of questions to ask as well, I think. Very often, but not always, 
they would bring with them a slide projector that they would employ in the telling of their stories. The stories themselves I don't remember, but the overall feeling of being entertained lingers. I even recollect that one night the elders arrived at our house and being very disappointed that there was no slideshow and that we had to listen to them talk. Such talking I tuned out as it seemed boring to my six or even younger brain. One subject I do remember of being particular importance was Joseph Smith and how he was very important to what these elders had to say. I remember there being some raised voices over the subject, but of the contents I am still at a loss. It is only in the past year that I discovered through various readings the Joseph Smith story, the finding of golden tablets, the translation of those tablets, to which now I would simply ask the question, Really? You believe that? I can also now take a fairly good guess at what those raised voices were about. The last and perhaps the most enduring of my memories is being told by my mother that we were not going to be baptised into the Mormon Church. Around this subject there form a few images of being quite excited about being baptised and being told we had to wear some kind of robe and be dumped in water, which for my six-year-old self seemed weird and kind of frightening. I was, of course, assured that it was safe and I would be a new person afterwards. As the day drew close, my anticipation grew. Then on Saturday, before the baptism of our entire family, I was told that it was not going to happen. When I asked as to why, I was told by my mother that she had prayed and prayed all week, but she could not bring herself to let it happen. I have no idea if this is the real reason, but looking back, I can envision some of the pressures my mother would have been under to both baptise us into the Mormon Church and to not. Our family were already members of the Ratana faith. This is the church of my father, and having learnt over the years about the strength and the veracity of my paternal grandmother's faith in the Ratna church, it is not too hard to guess that she would have been pressured by her mother-in-law to keep us within the Ratana faith, even though my father had died six or seven years earlier. I remember now during one of these arguments between my mother and my father's first cousin, who was a member of the LDS church, the phrase milk before the meat and wondering what it meant. Of course I have subsequently learnt the meaning of that phrase and now laugh when I hear it. The Ratana Faithful Church was founded in 1908 when the then ordinary farmer Tahu Portiki Wurimu Ratana was visited by the angel Gabriel in a field outside his house in the Taranaki district in New Zealand. I will turn to this church further on in this book. The Open Brethren, the Open Brethren of Wairoa. In the small town of Wairoa, population 4,000, all the usual churches were and are represented. Some are in very close proximity to each other. For instance, on Lahore Street, at the intersection of three roads, stands the Gospel Hall. Directly opposite stands the Anglican Church that we called the Big Grey Church, because of its menacingly large dark grey walls. And opposite that, on a third road, stands the St Joseph's Primary School of the local Catholic community. Also in the town are the Presbyterians, as well as the local Māori versions of those churches, and Ringatū and Atana. It is, however, the Gospel Hall of the Brethren Church, which I turn to now. We did not start out attending Gospel services at the church itself, but attended the Sunday school caravan that parked at the end of our cul-de-sac. Every Sunday the caravan would park up and open the doors for church to begin. Mr. Harry was the name of the mister, a kind man who seemed very devout. Those Sunday school services are more of the singing than anything else variety. They were the standard Bible stories all about Noah and Moses and Jesus doing miracles. At that age I was very impressed at the props they used to tell the stories. In fact, I still remember one of the songs. Here are the lyrics. Ten and nine, eight and seven, six and five and four. Call upon the Saviour while you may. Three and two coming through the clouds in bright array. The countdown's getting lower every day. Having just read those words, I now see that we were cheerfully counting down to the destruction <laughs> by the omnipotent, omnipotent dictator and his ritually sacrificed son. That being said, as far as indoctrination into this church, it was fairly ineffective, although we continued for a long time attending the church services 
and even on the odd occasion attending Sunday services at the Gospel Church on Lahore Street. I never personally felt the pressure to be part of this church as keenly as I had felt it from the Mormons. This church also held youth group type activities that was segregated by gender. There was every boys rally and every girls rally. These were held in the early evenings where marching, woodworking, singing and scripture were all mixed together. I remember being puzzled by the marching. I guess the idea of an army for God never struck home as it does now with a kind of dread that makes me shudder. Although we did a lot with this church, I don't think that we ever fit in. I never experienced anything but kindness and support from these very genuine people. My enduring instinct is that there was something not quite right. I seem to feel the sense when I reflect on those times, but there will be no attempt on my part to interpret that feeling as anything other than a confused adolescence. Anything else would be speculation. I must also comment that the families involved in this church were very welcoming, caring and very genuine in their faith. Good people all around. I don't quite know what happened why we stopped going. The Christian Revival Crusade I don't recall how we came to be involved with this church, but sometime, after ceasing to attend the other church, memories of the Crusaders' youth group appear. For some reason, my cousin and I both started attending this youth group. It may have been a parental strategy to keep now 12-year-olds busy in our small town, or another strategy to make sure our eternal souls would be saved. I think at least on my mother's part, it may have been a bit of both. Whatever the cause, we attended this youth group and had lots of fun. We attended every Thursday evening from 5.30 to 7pm. There were games and activities as well as the obligatory prayers and a service where the leader named Uncle Brian talked about the Bible and other church stuff. As I recall, one of our little competitions was to name all the books of the Bible and memorise them. I fear that I can still perform this feat at a push some 33 years later. It was during one of these sermons that this one incident in particular returns. One night Uncle Brian was preaching and a question popped into my head and I was asking my cousin what he thought about it when I was interrupted by Uncle Brian. What are you talking about here? Uh, well, what about the dinosaurs? I blurted out. Why aren't the dinosaurs in the Bible of God created earth? For the first time I saw a flash of anger across Uncle Brian's face and then a strange calmness. I also saw his wife react very badly to the question as she flashed a look of what would have condemned me to hell if there was such a place. Uncle Brian's answer was this. In the Bible it says that in the beginning the earth was void. So we do not know what kind of creatures roamed around at that time. That is where and when the dinosaurs lived. Now back to the lesson. I instantly knew that answer was bollocks. I could see in his face that this even question Uncle Brian's long held loose. He could not, of course, let us see that. But even to my young adolescent brain, it was obvious that the question rattled him immensely. I rem also remember a slight feeling of gotcha pass through my head. During school days and the long weekends, there would be camps with this group. We would go to places like Kinikini and Ma here and camp out and have church services, none of which I remember. At one of these camps held at the YMCA in Nopotama, I managed to sprain my ankle. Also attending this camp was an evangelical type preacher and his wife who were well-known faith healers. Upon seeing that I was injured, they asked if I would like to pray for my ankle to be healed. I said yes, but meant no. I avoided them for as long as possible, but they finally caught up with me and took me into a room at the side of the main hall. I was scared because I didn't know these people and didn't know what they were going to do. I remember a feeling of dread when they shut the door behind them. I took my seat in the indicated chair and looked at them. They must have seen the terror in my eyes, so they called in Uncle Brian so that he could reassure me that it was going to be okay and that the prayer, after the prayers I would feel much better. They even left the door open. This preacher and his wife and Uncle Brian knelt in front of me. The preacher placed his hand on my ankle and prayed. I don't recall the words, but in a couple of minutes it was over, and they announced that I could go and play, and by the next morning I would feel much better. 
This was the first time where I knew something wasn't quite right. I knew without the prayer that I would feel better in the morning because I knew the rest would do that. Of course, when I did feel better in the morning and I was clearly walking better, it was claimed that the prayer session had worked and the Lord had healed me. I didn't get it. I didn't feel any sense of being healed by any force other than rest. I certainly was not overwhelmed by the Spirit of the Lord or any other omnipotent force. A week after that camp, I was being looked after by my elder sister while my mother was away somewhere. She had heard that the preacher and his wife were appearing at the Christian Revival Church in Wairua. This was the main branch of the church that ran the Crusaders Youth Group. My sister decided that it would be a good chance, at least this was my feeling, to get rid of me for a couple of hours while she sent me to church, along with the nephew of her boyfriend. I was quite nervous, but I did agree to attend, and for the first time and the last time, entered that building. The service began tamely enough with sermons and prayers, but when the preacher took the stand, things changed. They took a far weirder course than I'd expected. The pastor, his name was Norman King, raised the atmosphere in the room to a fever pitch. The chanting got louder and louder, the room filled with a cacophony of praise for him, and then it happened. Speaking in tongues. All the hands in the room were raised to the ceiling, eyes closed, and everyone in a strange singing chant. Oh, hallelujah, we thank and praise you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. I looked around the room, shaking with fear and awe at this outpouring of what I could at the time only call craziness. I glanced at my friend and he also looked as dumbstruck as me. Stunned, confused and scared, but definitely not enraptured, I decided then and there I would never return to this weirdness ever again. This kind of religious strangeness I could do without. I have no doubt at all that those people could feel something, but I'm sure it wasn't by the look on their faces the fear I was feeling. So these are my memories of the religious influence of my youth. I now realise though that there were no memories of an absolute belief in God. A fact that that comes as quite a surprise as I write this. It was more the re that religion was something to do than not something to believe in. Ratana. Unlike most services, Ratana services are held in homes or on marae, or indeed anywhere where the people gathered. So like on many occasions, we went to a place called the ranch. The ranch was the family homestead of one of the branches of the Daimli family. It was cold and rainy that day, but us kids were told to play outside and wait our turn. Turn for what I didn't know, but I was with my cousins and always had fun together. When it was my turn, my auntie called out to me and I nervously went inside. Inside I found my paternal grandmother and her eldest son who owned the ranch, ready and waiting, dressed in their robes. I was ushered to the only seat that stood in the centre of the room and was told to sit. I was very nervous, but I knew and trusted these people, so I did as I was told. Led by my uncle, they both prayed as they laid their hands on my shoulders. When prayers were over, I was dismissed and told that I would be okay now. Although I was puzzled by the whole thing, I was happy to be let go. I had not discovered what the purpose of this prayer session was, and the less all the other partic participants of that day have passed on. Ringatu. I remember as a child being invited to participate in Ringatu services that were infrequently held at our neighbour's house. All I remember about the Ringatu church with all of us standing up and sitting down as prayers were said and hymns sung. What really stands out were the hymns. They were not like the hymns of other churches, but were sung in ancient Māori tunes, which I found at the time to be very monotonous. What stands out for me as I reflect is the variety of religious experience I had as a child. It seems strange to me now. I know also that this could be one of the reasons I ended up being an atheist. I can't honestly say that now for sure, but it seems likely enough.